Welcome to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, or just all-around inspiring human beings, not just focusing on their successes, but really shining a spotlight on the journey that they had to travel to get there. This week's guest is a longtime friend of mine. I've been knowing this man for many years. He was at the beginnings of my struggle to get into the music industry. And um, it was kind of his struggle to get into the music industry. And then I kept going and he made a diversion into fashion. And um, these are the interviews that I love to do because I love to bring to the table people who I know their journey intimately and they can help share with you not only what you need to do to get to where you're trying to go, but how to avoid the pitfalls. Please welcome fashion extraordinaire. And I, you know, I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation about how to build a clothing line, Mr. Paul Arrington. Paul, what's up, man? Hey, Sean, what's going on, bro? <laughs> oh, like I said, we got a lot of history together. You were there in the beginning. I don't want to make this interview about me, but you know, just for the audience, uh, one of the first groups I ever managed when I was struggling to get into the music industry was a group named um, Turnstile. Paul was Paul. What would you you were the, were the producer for the for the group? Correct. Yeah, I was producing, and um, we was putting it together. And I, you know, I said, Sean, you know, we need a manager, and. Uh, there you were, you know, you were, you were looking to get in the industry and, you know, came on board and, uh, you know, we put things together. I think the first thing we did was uh, at Sweetwaters, right? We performed at Sweetwaters. I, I, I don't even remember. Those days were so long ago. But, um, you know, it's always good to talk to somebody who was back in the beginning. Um, but um, your, your journey, it, it, it took a turn. Paul, how'd you go from music, number one, into fashion? Um, actually, it came down to someone that we, I think we mutually worked with at the time. And he said to me, he was, he was playing around. He was like, yeah, Paul Arrington menswear. He was trying to be funny, you know. So, but I took it and I was like, oh, okay, that sounds good. So let me see what I can do. So I went out and I sought the people that I needed to that knew about the fashion industry. And um, a person I was dating at the time, uh, you know, Jennifer, her aunt owned a factory and uh, she sat me down. She asked me what I wanted to do. And, you know, she kind of guided me through a lot of the process of what the machines were, you know, sewing and stuff like that. But at the time, I was like, man, look, I just want to make these samples. So um, she put together the samples. You know, we took some pictures. Uh, actually, the way the pictures came about was crazy, too, because we actually shot a lot of those in Sears. Uh, photo studio late night because you know I didn't, have, <laughs> um, I didn't have money to you know hire a real photographer so we went in the studio shot them uh, shot them with a lot of people you know too uh, one of them was uh, Ch uh, was Chuck if you remember um, he modeled for me for quite a while you know and it just took off from there you know I really enjoyed like you know coming up with ideas for you know shirts and you know hats and things and it just progressed. So, Paul, you know, we're, we're living in a time, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, everybody is now chasing their dream. And I wanted to bring you on to the platform because I've been getting so many requests to interview somebody who can give me the A, B, and Cs on what I need to do to start a clothing line. This is a big industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, um, urban fashion is, you know, out of here at the moment. So let me start here. First, is there room in the industry for a new line? Because it seems like everybody and their mother, with, with, the, with, with the, the advent of technology and things being so accessible to people, it feels like everybody has a clothing line. Is um, there room? There is. I mean, it's like with any industry, you, you come with an idea, the intent is to so-called build a better mousetrap, right? That along with creating your own lane, understanding what you're capable of and how you can create that path for yourself as far as bringing your ideas to life and getting people to see what you do and monetizing, you know, what it is you make so that you can make a living from what you do. But yes, there is one. There's always one, you know, for anything. Okay, so let's talk. Initial steps. I want to get started. I got this great idea. What is my first step? Is it 
incorporating, obviously? Is it finding a great name? And, you know, how important is a name to a clothing line? Is it website? Like, where, where does Sean start if I wanted to create a clothing line from scratch? Okay. I mean, if you were trying to start a clothing line, the first thing you would need to figure out, are you looking to sell clothes or you're looking to build a brand? There's a difference. There's a big difference. Selling clothes, you put pieces together. They may look good. People will appreciate them at the moment. And people will buy them. Building a brand is building consistency, building a look, building something that people recognize day in and day out and your intent to become a household word just like anything else. So that's the first place you need to start, trying to figure out what your intent is. With so me, my first line of thought would be, am I selling clothes? Am I trying to build a brand? I want to go back because I, want, I, I love that you brought this out. Selling clothes, would it be my clothes or is it just anybody else? Is, 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 am I just opening an online store to sell clothes? When you say selling clothes, what are we talking about here? Okay, when I say selling clothes, like you can have your own line but it's not your intent to per pursue like people knowing the name with a certain level of respect and consistency. Like you can go to a $10 store, obviously, and you can buy clothes. You can buy something that you've never heard of that you're buying for the moment. You know, you want a pair of jeans or shirts or whatever. You might be going to, you know, like a barbecue or something like, oh man, I just need a t-shirt with them on. You stop at a store and pick up something that I have a brand, a name, that you've never heard of, but you're not concerned about its quality and the story behind, you know, the company itself. Now, when you're building a brand, it's your intent to make the consumer know, like, hey, we take pride in our work. We take pride in the consistency of the process that it takes for us to bring, you know, these items to you, you know. So it's a whole world of a difference, and that you need to establish with yourself before you do anything. Okay, so say I establish that. I want to create a brand. I want the next, I don't know, Ralph Lauren. I want people to know, I want people to know my name. Okay. Let's go that direction. What are my first steps there? Once I establish that I am trying to build a brand. Uh, first steps are identifying the skill sets, what you have and what you don't have, what you are capable of and what you aren't. If you're a graphic designer by nature, I mean, most people start with T-shirts. It's easy to put together a few T-shirts, graphic designs, put them out there, especially now on, you know, social media. You have your Facebooks and your Instagrams. It's all too easy to put something together and see how people respond to it. As people are responding to it, you can say, hey, okay, well, let's add a few more pieces. Once you start adding a few more pieces, now you're looking at, do I need to seriously, you know, find screen printers or whatever it is you need to do to get that product in photographers or am I shooting it myself? You know, um, it's quite a bit, you know, to do and to get it there. You, you're going a little deep into the conversation. So I want to reel it back. Okay. You said you want to start, you know, it's better to start with t-shirts. Tell me why, why, why should anybody start with t-shirts as opposed to baseball hats, as opposed to jeans? Uh, t-shirts are fairly simple, you know, things to do. Uh, everyone wears a t-shirt. I don't think you can find anyone in this United States or pretty much any developed, you know, country that doesn't wear a t-shirt at one point or another, you know, so it's fairly easy to get t-shirts, get a good design, you know, get it printed and get it in front of, you know, your audience, your audience being whatever age group you decide, you know, put it on Facebook, put it on Instagram. And just see how people respond. And if they like, hey, I want one of those, that's when you know you need to start putting together like maybe an e-commerce or at least a shopping cart on your Facebook or on your Instagram where people can purchase it. And if it starts to move a little bit, you know, you got some more work to do. Got you. Are the markups on T-shirts any better than any of the other SKUs or the, just the T-shirts as simple as you said? Pretty much everybody wears a T-shirt. Um, it's a combination of both. The markups are always very good on T-shirts. Um, now, when what are we talking, by the way? Uh, depending on where you're trying to fit, whether you're trying to be a better quality sportswear, you know, product or you know, luxury markups can be anywhere from 100 to 200 percent, you know, easily. You know, I mean, you can walk into a store now and you can find yourself spending $25, $30 just on a basic T-shirt. 
And that's just as considered as a better designer. Once you started doing luxury, you know, you see T-shirts at $200, $350 for a T-shirt. I mean, there's reasons to justify it. And I'll explain it as we, you know, come along in the uh, interview. But the markups are, are incredible on it. Okay, so, you know, the average person is buying a $35, $40, $50 T-shirt. What are yeah. we talking there? The markups, is that still... 100 200 percent or is that now a little a little less maybe 50 40 percent markup uh no you're still you're still looking at around you know 100 200 percent probably greater than that you know again i don't want to give the exact numbers yeah. as the cost to you know make a t-shirt but suffice to say that yeah you're, you're well over you know the cost of making it especially in the beginning stages because you don't have much overhead you're doing your design work and you're sending it out to a screen printer Whatever he charges you, along with the cost of the T-shirt, is what, you know, what your costs are at the moment. So you're well above that, you know, well, well above that, uh, your, you know, your cost to make it and what your, your return on your investment is. Okay, great. I spoke about this earlier. How important is the name? You know, somebody coming up with a, with a great name, does it matter? You know, and if so, how important is it to trademark your name? Um, the name is very important because the name lends cre or credence to which are the types of product that you're trying to put out. You know, you don't want to put out something like some high-end, you know, T-shirts or sneakers and just name it Joe Schmo because people would be like, really? You couldn't take a moment, you know, to come up with a name that, that sounds appropriate for the you know, for the product, but you want me to spend my money, you want me to spend good money on something, but you're mentally lazy on, you know, putting together your concept and your, you know, your idea and product. So it is important. It is important, especially if you're building a brand. Um, and plus, you wanted something that's easy to remember and people don't mind saying that they have it on, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's, it, it is key. And trademark is, is very important. It will help protect you from people that wait for you to build and are standing right there to be like, hey, well, you know what? It's time for me to come in. You know, what was the the uh, the term back in the, I think, in the 80s? It was like run yours, which was meant like I'm taking yours, right? Well, that's what it would be. It would just be business-wise. And people are a lot more aggressive business-wise because of stuff that they can do to you legally. And it would just it would be a bad situation. So, yeah, trademarks are important. So the fact that a person would actually have a, a, a shirt that says Paul Arrington on it, yeah. is that not trademark enough? Or do you actually have to go through the legal process? And I ask this because a lot of people, they don't have a lot of money. So they're trying to streamline where they can. Yeah. Is it absolutely necessary to do it? Would you, I mean, obviously you said, yes, I would recommend it. But, you know, if we go into a court of law, can I say, look, I, you know, I, I put Paul Arrington on my shirt six years before, you know, big corporations snatched it from me. Do I have a legal leg to stand on? Uh, yes, you do. Like, have you ever seen a product or even a T-shirt or whatever it be in like in the little corner, it is a TM. Yeah. TM stands a trademark. That means you're alerting the, per the public that you're using this logo or whatever it is you're displaying as your trademark, but it's not registered. When you go ahead and register it with the patent and trademark office, you'll see a little circle and it has an R, the letter R in it, which represents a registered trademark. Now that means that the patent and trademark has acknowledged your logo as your brand, you know, and this is what you're putting out to the world to say, hey, this represents our products and our ideas. You can start without, you know, uh, doing a registration, but the first opportunity that you have to do so, I would. Got you. Let's talk finances, Paul. I'm an upstart. Don't have a ton of money. I listen to Paul Arrington's interview. He says, look, start with T-shirts. Markups are great on T-shirts. Everybody wears them. How much money am I looking at putting toward this venture? And how much money should I have in reserve? Well, fortunately, with technology, the, uh, the venture has gotten easier. You know, in the beginning, like when I started, I had to gather some money to buy T-shirts, go to a screen printer, pay the screen printer, you know, to actually print.
print the design on the t-shirts and then take it and hopefully, you know, sell them. Now there are so many options as far as like, there are companies called fulfillment printers and things like that, that allow you to join with them and you can actually put together uh, your artwork and upload it onto what's called a mock-up. So it will be a look of a t-shirt and then to have your artwork and you could present that on your social media and not having spent a dime at all, you know, and you can start taking orders. And what happens is, is that as the orders come in, you know, part of the order goes to the screen, screen print shop that you're partnered with. Part of it goes to you so that you both have the same information and you can see. So once the uh, order is fulfilled, the screen print shop will send it to your customer and, you know, there you go. Now you're starting to put, you know, product out there and you haven't spent the dime yet. Really? So <laughs> this is so interesting to me. And I was going to get into this a little bit, but I might as well talk about this now. You know, when we think of maybe it's the old way of doing business. You said start off with T-shirts, but let's just say you're starting off T-shirts, hat, whatever. Okay. The, 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 the cost of goods, are you no longer incurring that up front with these fulfillment centers? You know, because once upon a time, I would think you'd have to go out there You'd have to get samples of different T-shirts, samples of different hats, make sure that the fit was right, make sure it's the right um, texture and the cloth was right. Are you saying we can now bypass that step? Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to bypass that step. Again, because of technology, uh, with computers, internet, graphic capabilities. Um, again, you can put together a T-shirt, design it, and create a mock-up and know how it will look. 100% before you have a physical product in your hand. You know, years ago, you couldn't do that. It was like, okay, you got a good rendering of it. You know, you'd have like a sketch of it with your artwork, but you had to physically put together a sample because between your rendering and the actual screen printed finished work, it was a slight bit different, but now that's no longer the case. No longer the case. Okay, so in terms of startup capital, what am I looking at on average? You know, if you gave me a ballpark figure, and where's the money used? Um, as far as ballpark figure, right now, to tell you the truth, you could sit in your house if you had apps. As long as you had a computer and an internet connection, you can put a lot of this together at pretty much no cost in the beginning. And I say no cost, and I literally mean no cost. Because, again, if you sign up with a fulfillment printer, there's no cost for it. They're looking for partners because it's, it's, it's a good deal for you. It's a good deal for them. It allows them to expand their business without them having to send out salespeople to gather orders. So what they're doing is you're acting as that extension for them. You're coming like, hey, I got a line of T-shirts I want to do. You sign up with them. They agree. You know, you create your mock-ups. You market it to your people. And by marketing, you can go on Facebook. You can go on your Instagram. And you can get people interested. And if people are willing to order, as long as you have a link for them to, you know, purchase it through a shopping cart, even if it's a one page, uh, I don't want to say website, it'd be a one page web page at that point. As long as they can purchase and the order goes to the screen print shop and goes to you, you put up absolutely no money at that moment. And it's a great way to start. You know, now as the money, as the screen printer starts to pay you out based on the orders that you, you know, uh, process, you take the money, you look at it. Like, okay, what do I need to do to increase my marketing? You know, because marketing is the key to, you know, generating your leads, ultimately your sales. I, I, I want to hold off before you go to marketing. I want to okay. bring that on a little later in the segment. Is that okay? Sure. sure. Okay. I want to go back to, to these fulfillment centers. Number one, where do we find them? Are, are, are there better fulfillment centers than others? What, are the, what do, the, 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 do the splits look like? Um, well, of course, there are better fulfillment centers than others. That's just business, period. You know, some people have a better process or a better, you know, organization in their company on how to get things done and how quickly to get things done. Um, that is kind of a personal decision. You may, like, print with one company. You'd be like, all right, well, the print is okay. It's not great. And you find another company that does the same thing, and they may have a better way of printing the same, you know, uh, item. So maybe the colors are a lot more, you know, brighter and vibrant with one printer versus another. 
maybe one printer is using a technique called DTG and the other printer is using screen printing. You may prefer one versus the other. You know, those things make a difference in your decision as to who you're going to deal with and ultimately present your product to your customer. Where would I find a fulfillment center? Am I just going to Google? Is this word of mouth? Like when, when, and, and, and when I do find them, what am I asking? What are the questions that I'm asking off top? Uh, believe it or not, it's as simple as Googling, you know, screen print fulfillment, you know, and a whole list of companies will come up. And once you go to their website, they break down the process of what they do and what they offer and how to set up with them so that you can get started. So they pretty much anticipate every question that you're going to have prior to that. And it's on their web page. So you can pretty much get a good understanding what you're getting into before you even start with it. And, you know, once you sign up and you decide to call these companies, you can call them and be like, hey, I have a question about this. I don't see this listed as a service that you offer, but I'm interested in it. Do you offer it? Nine times out of ten, if they don't, they may say, you know what? You know, if you get enough orders in, we'll do it for you, you know, and we'll arrange the cost and you decide if it's okay for you. And you go ahead and along with it. You know, but it's fairly simple. It's a simple process now. Not like before where, like when I first started and I started dealing with screen printers and embroiderers, when you came in, if you didn't know the jargon, the industry jargon or the lingo. And that's what I'm asking. That's where I'm trying to go. So I'm, yeah. I'm glad you, you, you're going there. Yeah, it is, it's like talking apples and oranges, you know, because I remember I had an experience where I was talking to, um, I believe it was a screen printer. And I was like, yeah, I want this. And I went, they was like, what? Wait a minute, what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, but I want it to look like this. And, you know, he was like, what are you talking about? You know, and I, it, it discouraged me for a moment, but it also made me more determined, you know, because I look at other people, people's work and I'm like, if they can put this out there, I can put this out there. Let me just learn the industry lingo and then you'll start talking apples and apples and you'll have, you know, the same conversation and you'll understand each other. And the more you do it, the more efficient that you'll get at it. You, you'll be able to say to a screen printer, well, I need, you, need for you to use uh, a 230 mesh screen on this because I'm going to soft the hand and less ink on the shirt. And they'll understand you, but that comes with time and it comes with learning, you know, the uh, industry, you know, jargon. And that's with any aspect of it, not just screen printing. But with the fulfillment centers, you can go in there and you can be somebody like me who is just kind of off the street, just really has a great idea. I think I have a great design and I don't need all of that jargon um, it, to, to at least get me started. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. They make the process simple. You know, you present the artwork the, and through the internet, they allow you to log on to their site where you can upload your art look, artwork onto a, you know, um, a mock-up. You can place it wherever you want to place it, you know, and once you're satisfied with it, you can save it and send it to them and they'll look at it and they'll know what to do. You know, believe it or not, most experienced screen printers know what to do when they see your artwork. They, they can pretty much interpret what you want, even if you haven't stated every detail, even though you should learn it, but they're capable of interpreting what your intention is. Gotcha. Before I move the interview on, uh, you know, and I'm just trying to dive deep into initial costs, things like packaging, um, shipping, are those costs incurred by you, incurred by the, 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 the clothing line itself, or are the fulfillment centers taking care of those costs up front? Well, the fulfillment centers, they usually take care of all of it. But, I mean, they bill you all of it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you want to make sure that these items are built into to the cost that you're charging the consumer. So let's say like, and these aren't actual numbers, let's say the t-shirt from the fulfillment center costs, I don't know, $7 to make, and they're charging you $3 for shipping or whatever it be. So that's what, eight, nine, 10, about $10 so far, right? You're looking at about $10. So you're looking at charging the customer at least $20, $25. Now that covers, you know, the $10 for the shirt and the sh shipping, and then ten dollars additional, you know, in profit and things like that, or revenue. I don't want to say profit. Let me say revenue. I asked you earlier, what are the splits looking like? Because they take care of so much of the upfront costs. 
are the splits higher? Are they taking 80% profit and giving you 20%? Is there an industry standard at this moment? Um, well, it's not based on percentages. It's based on a flat fee. So they charge you a flat fee for the screen printing or whatever it is you're going to do with them. So let's say like you upload artwork onto a t-shirt, onto a white t-shirt. They may say like, okay, to get this job done, this is the cost. Once you pay what they're asking, there's nothing else that you pay them. It's a flat fee that you're paying them. You know, whatever you decide to mark it up, mark it up over that and sell it. That's all. That's all you. That's gotcha. All you earn. Wow. Um, couple of questions for you. Design. Are they providing graphic art artists for you, or is this something you have to outsource on your own? Um, again, technology has kind of progressed on that. There are two ways to go about it. Well, several ways. Let me not say two. If you're a graphic artist, obviously you can do your own artwork and then upload it onto you know their site and create your mock uh, mock up. If not, there are freelance uh, graphic artists that you can hire. You know, you explain your idea and they'll interpret it and send it back to you. Um, there are companies that you can actually put your artwork out there and different graphic designers will bid on the work, you know, to see if they can get the job at the lowest cost and you decide if, they, if the cost is right for you and if the, um, you know, if that's the person that you want to work with. Another avenue is that there are companies that provide thousands and thousands of like artwork templates. You can take a template and once you make the purchase, you actually have the license to use it and you can either use it as is or you can reinterpret it. You know, now, again, you have to keep in mind, this goes back to building a brand versus, you know, just selling clothes. If you're building a brand, you definitely want your product and your graphic to be unique. You don't want to use a graphic that someone else or 500 other people are using the exact same thing because it won't separate you from them. It won't say, hey, we took that time to sit down and meticulously design this graphic that we thought, you know, looked good and put it out there. If it is this easy, like, because, because the barrier to entry is extremely low. It, it, it doesn't feel like back in the days, you know, where you had to have so uh, a certain amount of capital to even get in the game. Yep. Why is it that so many clothing lines fail? Um, I think the failure comes from part of maybe your design ideas aren't that great, or maybe you fail to understand the difference between designing a good looking product and a product that's sellable. You know, as you progress through your journey, you'll learn there's a difference. You know, many people- Can you speak to that for a second before you move on? Sure. Um, designing a product that's sellable means that can you picture that product hanging next to another professional's product in a retail store? Can you see that product being, you know, posted at an online store next to someone else's product where the visuals look good? The, maybe the shirt, the quality of the cotton feels good. You know, are you using printed labels inside your shirts? Are you use, using woven labels? Are you using hang tags? The presentation becomes important at that point. And that's the difference between something that's sellable versus something that just looks good. Understood. In terms of inventory, are all of these products made to order? Or is there a certain amount of inventory that you have to have lying around waiting at this point? Or it's just every, because, and again, I'm not in your industry. And I'm really coming at this from a standpoint that I'm a complete novice and I want to help somebody who watches this because they may have the same questions. Having inventory, you know, because once upon a time, you, you know, in order to get a, let's say a t-shirt made, you had to make a hundred or, or, or 12 dozen. Mm -hmm. Those days based on what you're saying are gone. So are having inventory, are those days gone as well? Or are the well, fulfillment centers just making these things as they come in? Because from what I understand, and I'm sorry, from what I understand, it was more, it was always more expensive to make one piece, you know, five pieces, 10 pieces. It, 
the more you made, the cost of goods went down. Absolutely. The fulfillment centers, as far as the screen printing end, uh, they do what they call one-offs. So as the orders come in, you know, they print it and they ship it. What has, what has changed from when I first started to now, there are different print techniques, one of them being what's called a DTG. And the term, the acronym DTG stands for a direct-to-garment. And a direct-to-garment print is nothing more than a large, uh, let's say like an inkjet printer that has a pallet that you mount a t-shirt on and it actually runs through the printer, the, the print head, just like your printer at home, and it prints directly onto the garment. You know, unlike screen printing where there's a process, you have to create the artwork, make film positives, you have to make a stencil on the screen mount the screens on the press and register them and then make sure your colors are correct. It's a whole, whole different ball game, you know, as far as some of that, you know, um, it does eliminate the, the necessity to, you know, need, um, inventory when you're doing DTG, but DTG does have its limits. There are different techniques or like different specialties that you can't use on a DTG machine versus a uh, screen printing. Um, but there are ways around the inventory. There, once you start to learn, even if you progress past, you know, dealing consumer, you know, business to consumer direct, and you start dealing with retail stores, you know, you can take orders. And a lot of times these orders, they, they're giving you like 30 days to, you know, deliver on the goods, you know, whatever the amount of time is that you establish with the retailer for delivery, that's the amount of time that you have to come up with your product, so if you have inventory or not. You know, if you have inventory, it's a lot easier to get it to them quicker. But if you don't, you know, you got 30 days or whatever it is that you work out to produce your goods and deliver. Are there any cons of going this direction, meaning going through the fulfillment center? Because everything you told me, it seems like it's only pros. What are the cons? Uh, the cons are, especially like with the fulfillment centers, um, the DTG process isn't perfect just yet. So some of the shirts that you might get, the colors may not be as vibrant as a screen print. Or maybe you want something like a high density print where the ink is actually lifted off of the shirt and you can feel it quite a bit. Um, DG, the DTG doesn't allow for that. Um, some of the other cons are, are the fulfillment stable, you know, centers, are they relabeling you know, your shirts for you? Because a lot of people, when they first start, what they used to do is they used to buy the blank shirts, take out the label, and put print their label back in it. Mm -hmm. Some of the fulfillment centers will do it. Some of them won't. You know, uh, the other aspect is, are they shipping, you know, with your label on the box? So are they claiming that it's coming from Power Moves Incorporated, or are they claiming that it's coming from whatever the fulfillment center's name is? Are they putting that on the label? You know, that's the other aspect because you don't want your customer to see your back end. Correct. How it was produced and how it was gotten to them. You just want them to have the product with your name, your brand, and they love it. That's the only thing that they're concerned about. They're not con you don't want them concerned, well, this was made in Johnny Joe's factory. And his name is on there, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because then you start to wonder as a consumer, like, are you really making this or are you just telling me you're making this? You know, and, and, and it's not something you want. So these are some of the, you know, I asked you earlier about some of the questions that you should be asking up front. Is that a question that is fair to ask your um, fulfillment center? Like, look, when you guys are shipping it out, is it only my brand on the packaging? And will they be transparent about that? Absolutely. Um, what I goes back to one of the things I said, which you don't see on the website, you can call them and you can ask and you can say, hey, I don't see this on your website, but, but I'm looking to do this. Are you guys willing or able to offer it? Sometimes they'll say, yes, we, you know, we can offer it to you. Sometimes they'll say to you, well, we'll offer it to you once you start, you know, selling a certain amount, you know, of goods. Because what happens is they don't want to take the time and the resources to do the setup process, and you're not selling anything. So now that's an additional process that they had to put together and put the money out for and you're not moving in the units. So that's what I said. It, it can vary from, from place to place as to what they'll do and what they won't do. What about consistency? Let's talk quality con control for a second. Okay. Is there a way to enforce that 
all of my shirts are, you know, they're the exact same color. Um, it's the exact same quality of material. And I ask you this because and I don't, you know, maybe people still do this to the, to this day, you know, going on um, websites like Alibaba. And back in those days, you would get the, um, you, you would get a sample sent to you. You could feel it. You could touch it. You could put it on and make sure, okay, is this medium in line with all of the other mediums out there? You know, are the sleeves too long? Are the sleeves too short? I, what are the quality control measures that you can put in place, especially with these fulfillment centers to make sure I'm trying to create a brand? I need when people receive my package, it feels the way I envisioned it. It doesn't feel cheap. It doesn't feel like, OK, you bought a shirt from me two months ago and it felt one way, looked one way. And now I get the same exact shirt two months later and the colors are different or the quality of shirt is different. How do we enforce quality control? Well, in this case, you don't have total access to it, but there's two things you can do. Always order a sample. Like you said, that's first and foremost, you know, so that you get the sample back before you start offering it to your consumer so that you know what it looks like. Because it doesn't make sense for you to offer something to someone and you haven't seen your own product yourself. I'm sorry, are we ordering this directly from the fulfillment center or are you going to... No, you, you, you can order samples from them. You can, you know, upload your artwork, whatever it is you're going to do. And you, they, most of them allow you to order a sample that you have for yourself so that you can judge, hey, well, I need to tweak this a little bit or I need to do a little bit more of that and then they'll go back and do it. The other aspect, which you can do to see how they're shipping it as well, is have a friend place an order. You know, maybe you give them the $20, $25, let them buy the, the product and see how it comes to them. See what the box is looking like. See if it's labeled the way it should be. When they open up the box, is the T-shirt just thrown in the box or is the T-shirt in a plastic poly bag to protect it and, you know, look good as the box is being opened? Those are things that you can do just to see if they're doing their job. And if they're not, then you can always call them on it. You know, you pull their card on it and be like, hey, this is what I'm looking to do. You know, um, once you're looking to have total quality control, you're going to move past the fulfillment centers at that point. You know, they're, they're a good entry point, but they're not the end all be all to all of it. Once you start, you know, getting into some serious work and you're dealing with retailers that have a specific, you know, quality and a specific, you know, uh, set of colors that they want you to deal with, you know, it's a whole different ball game. Right in. Okay, so let's, it's a great segue. Let's talk, for one, I want to talk retail. I want to talk brick and mortar. Okay. Is it necessary anymore? And even if it's not necessary, is it needed to blow up your line? And how do I even get my stuff into brick and mortar? How do I get my stuff into these retail shops? I think at this point... <laughs> Brick and mortar, the question of brick and mortar is not whether it's a necessity, it's more of a preference and part of your business model. There are some companies that sell strictly online. They have absolutely no interest in dealing with brick and mortar retail. You know, they do well enough on their own, whether it be their website or they're selling on Amazon or whatever web stores that they're selling on, they're happy with that. They're generating their revenues and profit and, you know, they're good with that. Some people want a combination of web you know, presence and brick and mortar. The pros of a brick and mortar, a person gets to walk in and gets to feel it. You know, they get to see the product right then and there. Brick and mortar also allows for like a spontaneous purchase. There are some people that buy just you know, out of nowhere. Maybe it was a hot day and they went into the store because the AC was on or they just had some time to kill and they'll make a spontaneous pur you know, purchase on the spot. That doesn't happen with, uh, you know, internet shopping. A lot of times with internet shopping, people will look at the product, you know, your pictures have to be good because that's all they have to go by is what the pictures that you're showing. So your, the quality of your photography work has to be there also, you know, and that only gives the person, you know, a good idea of the look at the product, but it also builds trust because it's like, okay, I can see what I intend to purchase. It's not like this person is trying to hide anything. The picture's kind of dark here. I'm looking like, 
is that a, a P, an A on there? You know, <laughs> you know, you don't want that. You want people to just, you know, outright look at it and just say, okay, I like this, you know, and I can tell this is going to be for me. Um, but again, it's, it's not a question anymore of whether it's a necessity, it's a matter of preference, you know, in terms of brick and mortar. Okay, say is, is part of my business model. I want my stuff. I, you know, I, I, I feel as though I've arrived. I feel as though I'm official if I have my stuff in retail. Okay. What are my first steps? How do, how do I get in touch with a buyer? You know, is it necessary to get in touch with a buyer? Should I just go and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm Paul Arrington and I got, you know, this new clothing line. Let me speak to the owner. Who am I speaking to? Well, a long time ago, that used to work. And I actually did it in the beginning. Um, I remember when I started, there was a store called Gasoline Stop. And I had the pictures that we took from Sears and I walked into the store. And this store was actually in the Bronx, too. It was on um, White Plains Road, uh, right off of Lafayette in that Bruckner Plaza. And I walked in the store, had the pictures that we had, and I spoke to the manager, like, hey, I got this new line. I'm looking to get into your store. Who's the buyer? You know, it just so happens at that time, the buyer was the owner as well. So I sat up a meeting, spoke with him, sat down, did the presentation. He loved it. Now, it's a whole different story. Most uh, buyers don't even want to deal with the individual owners anymore. So nine times out of ten, you're looking for a salesperson. You know, a good salesperson that, one, you can trust. Two, that has relationships with the retailers that you're looking to deal with. You know, but salespeople don't come cheap either they know their value. They know your company is going to prosper based on their efforts. You know, so you have, once you start dealing with salespeople, you're looking at percentages of sales and you may be even looking at what's called a draw. So, and what that means is I might be paying you 25% of the sales, but I might be providing you a draw. And what a draw is I'm providing you money to go from one retailer to another or to be at trade shows. So I'm providing you money to, you know, to move around as well, you know, but if it's a good salesperson and they have the relationships that you want, nine times out of 10, you'll, you'll walk away with some sales. Okay. I'm sorry, Paul. And pardon me because this is your industry. It's not mine. Just like it's, there's going to be a bunch of people who they're entry level. They're going to watch this. I want you to go back a little bit. When okay. you say, the stores, they, they, they don't want to deal with the owners anymore. No. In terms of that? sales, in terms of sales, is it, is it a salesperson on your side or were you speaking about a salesperson who works for the, for the, for the retail outlets? Salesperson on our side, on the business, on the company side. So like you need, as a company, Power Moves Incorporated, you would need to hire a salesperson to carry your products you know, they're going to retail stores, you know, they're dealing with buyers, they're setting up appointments or have a buyer come to a location that you set up and they present the line. You know, again, the reason the buyers don't want to deal with a lot of the owners, a lot of times the buyers feel like the owners don't know what they're talking about, which is not necessarily true. Um, but the salespeople have cultivated relationships with a lot of these uh, buyers over years. Maybe they've carried several other lines, and this is the buyer that's been there for years, so they can call them up. I can be like, hey, Sean, I got a new line. You know, I think you'd be interested. I, it's great. You know, it's a, a lot of, you know, refreshing ideas, and I think, you know, people would really love it. You'd be like, okay, come on in. You know, no problem. Let's sit down and talk and let's go over it. Now, if it's someone calling you that you don't know and you've never met, they'd be like, hey, Sean. You know, I got this new line I want to, you know, present to you. And you're saying, well, first of all, how'd you get my number? You know, that's, that's the usual thing in whether it's fashion or industry. And then you start to explain, well, how you got your number. And they're like, well, you know, I'll put you under my assistant and we'll see if you can make an appointment, you know, with her. I mean, you know how the gatekeeping thing works, mm -hmm. you know, here. So, um, again, you have to find a good salesperson, you know, to carry the line that has the relationships you know, to get you to the retailers that you want. You know, once you do that, now you start moving forward and you're looking at trade shows, unless you have the money right off the bat to forego a salesperson and book a booth at a trade show. There are trade shows, fashion trade shows, where buyers from all over the world come to these trade shows in search of new lines, new clothing, new things. Now that's a whole different ball game. The expenses is, is very high. 
you know, you have to be able to present the booth, the expense of the booth itself, as far as visuals are, are costly, you know, and then setting up, you know, appointments with buyers to come to your booth because there are thousands of other companies there and you have to be able to get them to come to your booth and, you know, give them a good reason why. Can we, can we name a couple of the key um, trade shows that might be out there just in case somebody's interested in going that direction? Sure. Um, one of the prominent trade shows that everyone used to go to, not even, not just fashion, but you would, you would also get the music industry that would come out. I don't know if you remember some time ago was Magic. There's a show oh, in Vegas. Vegas. Yeah, called Magic. Magic was one of the biggest, you know, men's apparel, you know, shows, you know, in the industry. You know, you'd come, you'd buy your, you know, your booth, you'd set up your booth so that it was visually appealing. You had people to work your booth as far as making sure that buyers that came, okay, it was very orderly. They were comfortable. You'd offer them some, whether it be water or whatever your presentation was. And once they finished that, then they would sit down with whoever was handling your sales at that particular booth. You know, it, it, it was just an extraordinary uh, trade show. And it's still around. There are other shows like Project. Um, I can't name them off the top of my head, but there's, there's a lot of them depending on what you're but, doing. But it is pretty costly. Yeah, it is. A booth could easily run you like around eight to $10,000. That's on a small scale. And that's just to get in. That's not building a booth out itself? That's not building a booth out. Okay. Of the pros, I'm assuming, to getting into these trade shows, you have thousands of buyers in one location. In one location, absolutely. So you have the potential to write more sales than what you paid out you know, in terms of cost of the, you know, booking the booth and, you know, building out the booth, you know, but it's, again, it's, it's a chance you take, especially as a new line, you know, as a new line, you can't afford to usually take that type of expense and put it to all of that. And if you only write like $3,000 in sales, but you spent like $20,000 in, you know, a uh, trade show occurrence and, you know, you're kind of upside down on your, you know, on your cost. Yeah. yeah. Can we go back to a salesperson really quick? Sure. Typically, do the salespeople work just for you or are they independent contractors? So, you know, you spoke about salespeople having the relationships with these buyers. If I'm a guy who's starting up my clothing line, do I want a salesperson who is just focused on my line? But obviously, I'd have to pay them a little bit more or a lot more because you said that they don't come cheap. Or... Are these salespeople, because they have the relationships, all of the clothing lines share them? Um, well, there's pros and cons to both. If you have an independent salesperson only working for you, you know all of their time and effort goes into, you know, your product, you know, pitching your product. If you catch a salesperson that represents multiple lines, he'll carry your line and he might have another line that's very prominent at the moment. You know, and while he's showing that, yours happens to be, you know, on the rack at the same time, you know, and the buyer is looking at it like, hey, well, what's that? You know, so you're, you're kind of piggybacking off of another company's, you know, established, you know, look and reputation already. And you're getting some notice because you're being carried along with someone else. You know, um, salespeople have, you have independents that walk around and carry the product from store to store or buy off the to the next office, and then you have some salespeople that have showrooms. And when they have showrooms, they'll have like your line set up with several other lines and the buyers come in and they'll show them. Like I said, there's a benefit to it because you might be in the same showroom as like maybe G-Star Raw or something like that. And your product is sitting right next to it and the buyer happens to glance over, you know, like, wow, what is that? I like that. And the only reason that, that buyer happened to see your stuff because he was there to see G-Star other than that, he may not have noticed your, your line at all. Got gotcha. you. Um, you know, interesting because the the the, the salespeople, it's a necessary expense at some point in your business model, would you say? Yes, absolutely. Say you're blessed enough. You get your stuff into retail. Is it a consignment deal? What, what, what are the terms that we're looking at? You know, is it net 30? Is it next 60? 
Um, most stores, depending on the size of the store, will determine whether they, what type of terms they're dealing with you on. A small mom and pop store may do a consignment. You know, if you do a consignment deal, all the financial risk is on your end. That means you're producing the... But for anyone who does not know the term consignment, can you break that down? The term consignment means that you provide the product to the store, they take it without paying for it up front, and over a certain period of time, they have a certain amount of time to sell it, and as they sell it, they pay you for it as it sells, versus a net agreement. A net agreement is, let's say, like a Jimmy Jazz or something. They may buy, I don't know, let's say 200 pieces, and then they, you agree to, for them to pay you in 30 days. You know, it's basically like you're extending them a line of credit, you know, with your goods. You know, um, you know the, the difference is you, you prefer to be in a, a net agreement versus a consignment because a consignment, the store may look at it like, well, I don't have any financial responsibility here. I can just give this back to you and just be like, well, I didn't sell. And, you know, now you're stuck with all this inventory. You know, once you start dealing with stores that are doing net 30 terms, they have some financial responsibility to you as far as paying for what they bought. You know, um, there's ways around to kind of pad, you know, having to wait for your capital to come from them. It gets a little complex by then. You start dealing with uh, companies called factors. And what a factor does is like, once you deliver the goods to a store and there's a net 30 with them, the factor will step in and pay you a certain percentage of the PO or the invoice, the value of the invoice so that you have some capital while you're waiting for the rest of it to come from, you know, the, uh, the retailer. It gets, it gets complicated by, by the time you start dealing on that. Got you. I want to, I want to talk about printing. Say you, you say for whatever reason, you want to print your stuff in house, which many people do. Is there a benefit to that? And what are the costs associated with it? And where do I start? What equipment do I need? Uh, printing in house, which is exactly what I do. Um, for my company, we're pretty much, I would say, greater than 90% vertical. And what that means is that I can go from a design idea and concept to a physical, physically printed shirt or a physically you know, constructed hat or embroidered hat or whatever it be, even the denim. We have you know, 12 industrial sewing machines here. So we can pretty much put anything together here. It allows you quality control. It allows you efficiency, efficiency and speed. The downside to it, the equipment costs can be kind of costly, but you know, like with anything, you build a piece at a time. You buy your important pieces as you can, you know, and you start from there and, and you build on it. But if you try and, you know, buy it all out at one time, it's very expensive. You can spend upwards of 100000 or better, you know, on equipment. You know, and I was talking to someone the other day. What happens is with equipment is sometimes there's a rabbit hole that goes with it. There's always a problem, but then there's always a solution to that problem. And then the, the solution creates another problem. So you find yourself constantly buying and buying and buying. And at some point you have to say to yourself, well, you know what? I don't need that. Let me figure out how to use my skill set, you know, to solve whatever the problem is. Um, in this case, let's say like you're printing and you need to get your orders out, right? Um, what am I doing in terms of inventory? All right. You don't want to stock too much inventory. Matter of fact, you don't want to stock any inventory if you can you know, there are places that you can have like, you know, blanks manufactured or if you can make them like we can now, we can make some of those here. We can make the style blank and as the orders come in, we can print them. And the benefit of that is, is that if a particular style doesn't sell, now I'm not sitting on it here in house. But if, you know, if I have my blanks, those blanks can go to any one of the styles that I offer, you know, at any given time. So there's, there's no loss on my end. Okay, I want to, you know, stick here. You have great information. Thank you so much for being so open with this information. I know you're going to benefit so many people who watch this. Printing in-house. If I just, you know, I'm starting with T-shirts. What 
machines do I need to start with? And what does that initial investment look like? I know putting together a whole printing facility, you said it could be upwards of 100,000, but I don't have that much. What can get me started? Um, at the very basics, if you're looking to um, screen print, there are places like you can buy, you know, pre-owned screen print equipment like a press, a press maybe like one, two station press, uh, four colors. I wouldn't recommend anything that's incapable of pre printing anything less than four colors because anything less than that, you're almost wasting your time. You're going to expand very quickly and you're going to see the need to be able to print more colors and it's just going to be it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, again, you can buy something small like that, and they have them so that they fit on a tabletop. You don't even have to buy the stand, you know, to go with it, and you can put it on your tabletop. You can, you know, create your films and your stencil or your screens, and you can pretty much start, you know, right away at home. You know, I would estimate something like that. If you could put together at least like, you know, four, five hundred dollars you could get started in that area. You can get started for that low? Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just have to mentioned. know how to look. You have to know how to look for a used or pre-owned, you know, press um, and the additional things that you need along with it. But, yes, it's doable. Okay. You mentioned you can get something pre-owned. Is that something that you recommend? Do you do that yourself? Obviously, if it's pre-owned, it's not coming with a warranty. You know, is there a lifespan to these things? Um, when I first started, yes, and you know, we had, we had some pre-owned uh, equipment, and again, one specifically in the screen print area, those presses, a lot of them are made of steel, so these are items that are going to last you for a long time, so it's, it's like buying a car, you know, someone can use a car and put, you know, 60,000 miles on it and sell it, and the next person is still, you know, getting an item that still has quite a bit more, you know, use, you know, out of it, so it's the same thing with the screen print, and you know, parts are replaceable. So let's say like you buy a screen print press and I don't know, maybe one of the pallets that the t-shirt goes on is not great. It's easy to replace it, you know? So you can replace these things to the point that you almost have a brand new press, you know, and you paid little to nothing for it versus going to a company and buying a brand new press and the press alone on a small scale might cost you like $4,000 just to press. That doesn't include everything else that you need, like a dryer um, to cure the shirts, what they call a flash dryer to temporarily cure the shirts to the touch, um, and exposure, you know, all that stuff can easily, you know, easily run you a lot of money. But if you buy it pre-owned one step at a time, it's doable. Again, what is the process? Is it Google? Are there retail locations I can go in and buy? Like, how do I even get my hand on secondhand stuff? You can or, or you can, new for that matter. You can Google use screen print equipment, or you can use the handy dandy eBay because <laughs> eBay <laughs> eBay is good for that stuff. Believe it or not, there are a lot of screen printers and screen print companies that expand, and maybe they have equipment that's just taking up room in their shop, and they'll put it on eBay. And it might be a manual press and the whole setup, and you know you might get the press like five hundred dollars, or you might get the press and the whole setup you know, I don't know, maybe close to a thousand dollars, which would have ran you more than that had you bought it new. You know what I'm saying? So you just have to look around. You have to do your due diligence and look. You know, always make sure you look at the person's feedback because you don't want somebody that got feedback and like their score is like eighty seven or something like that. And you make the persons and you find out why their, you know, their feedback score is eighty seven, like you don't get the item or like something like that. But as long as you do your homework, you're pretty you're pretty safe about that stuff. So. Okay. Are there any retail locations that just sell these types of items? Uh, Pre-owned and new? Absolutely. There are manufacturers that sell uh, screen print equipment. The entry level stuff to professional stuff in terms of a manual screen print press. And what I mean by manual is that you actually physically have to turn the two carousels. There's a carousel that, that, has the screens or the stencils on them, and then there's a carousel that has the shirts on a platen. And as one, let's say like you print one color and you finish that color, you have to turn the bottom carousel to print the next shirt. You know, so that process just occurs over and over. You're turning the carousel with the shirts or you're turning the carousel with the colors to change colors. 
you know, um, but there are companies that, that sell them. If you're asking for specific names, there are companies like Vastex, which is an excellent company to start with in terms of um, if you're looking to buy new equipment from them, they produce a lot of their stuff in-house, you know, so it's not like they're outsourcing pieces from anywhere else. They make, and, you know, their, their items themselves, and they're an excellent company. And I still use Vastex uh, products. Got you. Let's talk e-commerce for a second. Do you use platforms like Spotify? I mean, excuse me, Shopify yourself? Absolutely. Um, my so you personally today use today, Shopify. I, I use Shopify. Yep. Right this second. Right this second. What are the benefits of Shopify and are there competitors out there? And why not use the competitors? Um, there are competitors out there. Uh, Shopify, to me, just seems so easy. And the way I came across it, and believe it or not, I was watching Shark Tank one night. And, and it wasn't about, you know, e-commerce or anything, but the conversation came up between Damon John and the other Sharks. And he mentioned about, you know, uh, Shopify. And I think he has some, he does support them to some degree. I don't know what his financial interest in it is or was. But when he mentioned it, I looked into it and did some homework. Shopify is very easy to use, to set up. They have templates that you can use. They have third-party companies that provide apps to be able to expand the functionality of your website. So if you need your website to do automated email responding, if you need your website to have, you know, good shipping, you know, and logistics, there are companies that will provide third-party apps that you plug into your website very easily. Some are free and some are paid. And you can expand the functionality of your your website easily, you know, less than five minutes. How how expensive is it, is it month over month um, bills that are associated with having a Shopify site, or is it one time fees? How expensive is it to to go through that platform? Well, Shopify has like different um, pricing, you know, levels. They have an entry level, which I think is maybe about maybe less than $15 Then they have like a mid-level, which is about $30. Then they have one above that, which is maybe about $50, $60, something like that. You know, you determine what you need at the moment, what you can afford and what you need at that moment that's going to get the job done for you and so you can expand. Um, but again, Shopify was, was very easy to use. There are some other companies that don't make it as simple. Like I had a company before uh, that I used called Start Logic, and I'm not, you know, shouting them out negatively, but you had to really know how to develop, you know, your web page. You had to understand the HTML languages, the XML languages to develop the page with them. Shopify, you don't need to do any of that. You know, as long as you can, if you buy a template from them or use one of their free templates, you can swap out the images, put your images, and they allow you to do the coding behind the scenes if you need to change some things. But basically, it's a drag and drop, you know, um, feature with them. Your company, Paul Arrington Denim Studio, before going online, and, you know, I didn't ask you this. Are you exclusively sold online through e-commerce, or are you now in retail as well? I used to be in retail. Right now, um, specifically online, e-commerce. And you see the trend heading that way because you see a lot of brick-and-mortar stores even closing during the course of this pandemic, they found that, you know, people are willing to shop more online, not only because of the pandemic, but just for the convenience of it. If you have to drive to a store and let's say you get in your car and you put $20 in gas and you buy one item, you know, now you've paid for the item and you paid for the $20 in gas, whereas I could have sat in front of the computer, bought that same item and get the free shipping and have it the next day, you know, without all the hassle. You know, and they find more and more people are, you know, headed in that direction. So they're closing, you know, their brick and mortar stores, uh, not only because of the big pandemic, but to save money. But yes, I'm exclusively online with my own site and I'm on Amazon as far as in U.S., Canada and Mexico. How long have you been exclusively online? I would say the last three years, three, four years at the most. Going have, you found, 
have you found that your margins, have you had an uptick in business? Have you found that it's going down now that people just can't physically walk into the store? I understand we're living in a pandemic. Nobody's walking into retail at this moment, but you did this long before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Transitioning for you, was it just part of your overall business model? And did you see a hit in terms of your overall profits? Um, I didn't see a hit in terms of profits because, again, there's less to deal with. Like, once you start dealing retail, um, brick and mortar, you have to make sure that your price, your wholesale price, is low enough that it accommodates the store, but enough that it accommodates, you know, covering your expenses and your costs and things like that. So, and this is not real numbers, but let's say, like, there was a shirt that was, like, $25 that you're selling to the public for $25. So obviously you can't sell that shirt to a brick and mortar at $25 because then they can't sell it at $25. Right. So therefore you have to come up with a wholesale price that accommodates your needs and your profitability, but still allows them to make money too. So now that $25 shirt may become $12 and 50 cents that you're selling it to them at so that they can make their markup. But within that $12 and 50 cents, you have to be able to cover all of your expenses. Now, the upside and the downside to that is that with the retailers, you get, you know, again, sporadic, you know, spontaneous, you know, purchases. So there are times that you might get a purchase more frequent, you know, with the stores. And plus, they're helping to push it with their own marketing and whatever else that they do to promote the stuff in their store. When you're dealing online, your margins can be a lot higher. So let's say, like, I'm charging $25, $25 for a shirt. Well, obviously, it didn't cost me $25 with the shirt, and I don't need to share that, you know, expense with anyone else. So, like, I cover my expenses, and anything over that, you know, for me, becomes profitability. Um, I, I saw myself going that way a long time ago because, again, as I was building, you know, my vertical aspect of the business, the printing, the embroidery, um, we do the photography in-house, some of it, not all of it, um, and we're heading in terms of video it just made sense for me. I could control like putting out the product. So let's say a consumer wants it. I can print it pretty much on, on demand behind the scenes versus like having a retailer tell me, okay, well, you got 30 days to get X number of product, you know, to us, although we can, and we get the product to them and they're like, well, you know what, this is not selling. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, you know, we're going to mark down, you know, the cost of some of this and put it on sale. But we want you to pick up the, what we're marking down, we want you to cover that expense. You know, it's, it's, it's a hassle. You know, again, there's good aspects and there are bad aspects to retail versus e-commerce, you know. Okay, talk to me. Before we close out, Paul, you're exclusively online now. Yep. How are you getting traffic? How are you getting people to know about your brand? How are you standing out in a sea full of, you know, different brands that are out there, some who have way more money in the budget for marketing than you. And I'm assuming most of your marketing is done online and I'd like you to touch on the different ways that you do market online, but are you doing any offline marketing? Are you doing product placement? Is that even necessary in this day and age? Absolutely, it still works, it's still effective. As far as online marketing, again, social media has made it easier for most people to reach other people. Um, I still deal with stuff directly on my personal and my business Facebook page, uh, business Instagram page, and I was doing a lot of Facebook marketing. Right prior to uh, the pandemic, I was doing a ton of Facebook marketing. So I was getting, you know, numbers like, you know, seven, eight, nine thousand people that were viewing ads on a daily basis. You know, so if you take 30 days and let's say like 8,000 people, you're looking at what, um, 200 and something thousand people by the end of that particular month. So if you're doing that for several months at a time, you're reaching hundreds of thousands of people that you probably wouldn't otherwise, you know, have done so marketing out, you know, offline, let me say it that way. You know, offline becomes a little more difficult. I mean, that's, I think your specialty was in the mar is in the marketing area, so you know. You know, marketing offline is a lot more difficult to reach those number of people. You know, whereas I can sit here and create an ad, upload it to Facebook, you know, uh, pay whatever the fee is that they're asking for per click. 
you know, um, because once you start advertising online, you have to understand how the logistics of the advertising work, you're paying per click, you're not paying per view and stuff like that. So you have to constantly be mindful, okay, I'm getting 8,000 views, but how many people are clicking through out of those 8,000 views? You know what I'm saying? So that stuff you have to constantly, what they call it, analytics? I think that's what it's called. Yep, you analytics. To, you have to be mindful of that stuff. But, but um, again, you're still reaching more people than you would have offline. So um, the benefits. Paul, I'm definitely going to bring you back just in the interest of time. You know, you've given out so much great information. It's probably best to end it here. But I'd love to bring you back on if you are available um, and probably make this a regular thing because I think that you have tapped into so much great information. Um, I feel so much more educated than when I initially started this interview. Uh, if, if anybody wanted to find you or purchase some of your items online, what is the best way that they can reach you personally or buy or see, view your items online and buy it? Well, you can go directly to our website, uh, www. Does anybody say that anymore? But, uh, Paul Harrington, <laughs> venomstudio.com. Um, our email address is there, info at Paul Harrington Venom Studio, and there's a phone number there. So um, you can call or you can email, whichever is best for you. Or you can check out the Facebook, you know, or the Instagram. With The Facebook is Paul Harrington Denim Studio. The Instagram is Paul.Arrington uh, Denim Studio. And, you know, either way, I do check the messages. I do respond to them, so myself. So if people reach out to me, I answer everyone personally. Paul, I appreciate you. Like I said, we had a ton of people who have requested that I bring somebody onto the platform who is knowledgeable and experienced in the area of starting a clothing line. I think that you have given everyone some great, great tools in education to get them started and off the ground. I appreciate you. I thank you. And you are a true power move maker. Thank you. Bro, I, I enjoyed being here. You know, I, I, I wish we had some more time, but I'd love to come back. Because, like I said, we got history, man. I was hoping to get to that part, but, you know, you know it is what it is. <laughs> we will next time, brother. We will. All right. <laughs> All right, you be good. All right, Sean. Thank you, bro. <laughs>